That's not even in tune. Called Aeolian tones. No, it's not. Uh, Aeolian tones. What? That is supernaturally fast pizzicato. Hello everyone, I'm Patrick. I'm a musician, I'm a composer, recording artist, and arranger. I play trumpet and bass, but I'm also a music teacher, and I've been a music teacher for around a decade, so I have a lot of experience with different styles of music, music theory, and music history. But I'm also a fan of Doctor Who, and I was really excited about this new season of Doctor Who that is coming out with Russell T Davies back at the helm. And I was particularly excited when in the trailer I saw there was gonna be an episode with the Beatles. So that's what today's video is gonna be. It's gonna be me reacting to this Beatles episode of Doctor Who. Uh, the Devil's Chord. So, let's jump right in to The Devil's Chord. Right off the bat, I love matching the notes with First the title note. card coming up. And we have a tune. Then, we have a melody. Mm, difference between a tune and melody. Beethoven wrote this. Arbitrary. When he first discovered he was going deaf. All that rage. I don't know if the history of this story is true, but I'll take their word for it. Something beautiful. Am I boring you, Henry? There is one thing you might like. It's called the Devil's Chord. Tell me more, sir. It was banned by the church in medieval times in case it allows the devil to enter the room. Okay, so I've got to stop here. This is just completely not true. Uh, the tritone, the chord that they're talking about here was not at all banned in the Middle Ages. This is a complete musical myth. No one actually believed that it would summon the devil. I'll link a video down in the description from Adam Neely where he goes more into this story and this myth and where it comes from. But basically, uh, it's completely not true. It's completely a fabrication. No one actually believed this. The tritone was never banned in the Middle Ages and no one believed that it would summon the devil. But it's an interesting premise for a Doctor Who episode, so let's see where they go with it. Oh, oh, goodness me. What? Really cool to have the knock come out from the... The knock come from inside the piano. Who are you? My notation is... Maestro. My notation? What it's really I weird mind? use of language there. Um, Mr. Timothy Drake, you're a genius. Greatest composer. Whoever lived. This is what every music teacher composer wants to hear. <laughs> Absolute fantasy moment. You never had the luck. You never got that. Really weird background music, this dinky rock and roll. Understood me. All those melodies stifled and strangled inside you. Art. The tone of the music just does not match their performance at all here. I, it just feels really jarring to me. Like, I like the music, but it just doesn't fit the scene. Uh. Would you like me to set them free? Very cool animation. This CG music, Western notation coming out. The staff. Very poor conducting. I love this, using the the piano, the diegetic piano playing to transition into the theme. Really cool. I don't like that they bring in the actual music for the rest of this sequence. I think it would be much more effective and way more interesting to keep the solo piano arrangement all the way through. Uh, I think a bit of a missed opportunity there, but whatever. Cool transition. I like that. I like the mix of diegetic and non-diegetic music. I think it's cool. I want to see the Beatles recording their very first album. 
absolute like why has no Doctor Who companion ever asked for this before? Well, Classic asked. destination. Because Surely this should have already happened. But mom, she had a girl never too late. Claire, and she loved Claire and she was dead into Bino. She had all the Beatles albums. We used to play them every day after school. Ten years old of us. We had Revolver, the White Album. So yeah, if I could go anywhere, then that's Revolver, where I'd White go. Album, great Beatles albums. Probably two of my favourites. That is amazing. Oh, right. Yep. Absolutely. What did I say? What did I say? Yeah, why? Good thinking. The different outfits this season are already really cool. Like, the different fashion statements from the Doctor. I really like uh, this doctor as the fashionable doctor. I think it really works. It's all in the air, you hear it everywhere. No matter what you do, it's gonna rain. Last music direction choice here. This song is really cool. I like it. I don't know the song, but I like the vibe. I do believe this is not the real Abbey Road. Like, I don't think it really matters. Like, we know culturally, yeah, cool, The Crossing, it's Abbey Road. And I believe this is not actually Abbey Road Studios. It doesn't really look like Abbey Road Studios, but it's fine. We know, we know what it is. The EMI Recording Studios. Good morning. Cup of tea? Uh, We've got George Martin yeah. here. Make it a strong one, two sugars. Uh, boys. How you talking, Paul, lad? I just want a good night's sleep. These voices just like don't add up. <laughs> alright, alright. Okay, so these four do not look like the Beatles. Uh, surely, surely they could get people that actually looked like the Beatles. Like, surely it is not that hard to get a, four Beatles lookalikes when you're producing Doctor Who. Like, surely they could get better lookalikes. I mean, I guess they do have to act, but sure, surely you can get people who look better than this. I don't know. I just feel like it's close enough, I guess. Then George, when you're getting paid, seven quid a day. Three, two, one. I've got a dog, he's called Fred. My dog is alive, he's not dead. He's my dog, he's not your dog. If you want a dog, get your own. <laughs> this is such a great gag. This is such a great gag to have the Beatles there and you're expecting they're going to play Beatles music, we're going to watch the Beatles record and then just to throw us this complete garbage song. It's such a great setup for the episode. Really, really funny. Um, I love that the song is about a dog because it just reminds me of that um, that really hilarious video that's like this fake Beatles song, like, uh, it's okay to leave your dog in a hot car. It's okay. As soon as I heard them play, start playing this song, I was like, is, is this just a send up of It's Okay to Leave Your Dog in a Hot Card? The famous fake, not real Beatles song. I think it would be really funny if they actually played that. But instead, we got My Dog Fred, uh, equally garbage song. Great little, little simultaneous. Good luck, Silla. Three, two, one. I love you, you love me. We are two, we are not three. But happy, I think, perhaps. <sighs> this is really interesting because writing lyrics that flow is always tricky. And I think it's really interesting how they've, they've written this line of lyrics that are bad in very specific ways. I don't know, it's really interesting. Like, like the forced rhymes, like, you and me, we, we are two, we are not three. Like, sometimes you hear amateur songwriters do this kind of stuff where the, the lyrics are, fo like, forced into a rhyme or they just don't feel natural. I think it's really interesting to hear this 
and but to do it in a way that's not like ah oh, it's amateurish it's like very clearly bad i think it's very interesting um and a great setup for the episode we're we're only like what a fifth of the way in and it's very clear what's happening music just isn't working where it should very cool and roll to record please <laughs> I love the orchestra playing just awful, like, primary school band level. So funny. We've all heard that. We've all heard that in a school band or something. Everything's gone dull. No one hums, no one whistles. They're not the Beatles. No one taps their feet. I don't get it, though. Music isn't... Like, you can't lose it or steal it or kill it. It's just natural. You get music when... The wind blows through the trees. It's called Aeolian tones. No, it's not. No, it's not. This is so dumb. Uh, Aeolian tones. What? They have, they have uh, like Murray Gold on payroll, right? They had no one that they could ask about this. Okay, so and Aeolian tones makes no sense because a Aeolian is like a scale. Like we have a major scale and we have a minor scale. An Aeolian scale is just a minor scale. It's just the natural minor scale. You might be familiar with your harmonic minor scale. The Aeolian scale is just the natural minor without that raised seventh. So saying Aeolian tones, it, it, it's it's meaningless. It's a it. it they're making it sound like this weird sci-fi term for, for music, this weird, like, supernatural musical word, but it's not. Like, this would have landed so much better if they just made up some random word to describe what music is, but instead they use this word Aeolian. Like, like could they not have asked Murray Gold or any musician? It just feels so weird to hear this word in this context, and anyone who knows their music theory and their modes is just instantly confused. And if you're a music student learning about modes for the first time, they can seem really weird and confusing. And there's all these weird words for them, like Locrian and Phrygian and Lydian and Mixolydian and Aeolian. And having it in this context as this weird supernatural thing just reinforces that feeling. I think it's really bad for music information dissemination to use this word in this context. I'm probably blowing it out of proportion, but I think it's really weird. It makes no sense. I don't know how this slipped through the writer's room, and I don't know why they didn't just replace it with some random sci-fi word. It makes no sense. Let's keep watching. For music, music is the highest form of thought. If you take that away, Finland. I like... I like that he says music is the highest form of thought. I don't know even as a musician if I agree with that. But I like how much reverence the Doctor as a character has for music. It's really nice to see, especially in a world that seems to decreasingly value the arts. I really like that the Doctor has such a respect for the value and intelligence of music. If music is gone, that means everything is changing. Okay, so what do we do? You take John Lennon, I'll take Paul McCartney, find out what's happened and when it happens. No Ringo? No George? Who's gonna take... You take Paul, I'll take John. Or the other way around, I can't remember which. Who's gonna talk to George? Who's gonna talk to Ringo? Where's the Ringo and George love? Disappointing. You are writing songs for the band, yeah? They're not very good, are they? Oh, oh no, no. Great. <laughs> really weird to to see a Beatles saying our songs aren't very good. Kind of funny. That's great, lad. That's how it should be. It's not like the old days when we had waltzes and fandangos and all that. What we're doing here today is the last gasp. I can make a bit of money out of cheap old rhymes, so I can settle down and get a proper job. It's embarrassing singing. Really kind of sad, right? It feels really sad to watch people talk about music with such disdain. I think I think this is a really great way to set up what's going on. Like the we've already set up that the that the music is bad, but now we're setting up the emotional story behind that. 
love this. Forget it. But Paul, see, when it's just you on your own, don't you think that there must be better songs? How do you know that? Is it like, I get this thought. Like, it's so far away. It's a note. A single note. And then a second, and a third, and fourth, and fifth. And you put them together. I like the music in the back matching the note, like him talking about the notes and they appearing in the music behind him. Like a G, then an E, and a G maybe twice, and then C. And if you put words to it, words right from your heart. I love you so much. He did not sing. He did not sing the notes that he was talking about when he sang those words. Do you know who you are with your ideas, pal? Disgusting. You are disgusting. The thing is, that music, dance, must be gone. No one dances anymore. I mean, can you dance without music? I mean, you can, but do you want to? I love this talking about dance and its connection to music. Uh, for a lot of cultures, um, music and dance are inseparable. And uh, this kind of separation of music from dance that we have in Western culture is kind of unique in a lot of, um, in like across, is kind of, is unique across the world. It's kind of this weird thing that music and dance, like the idea that you could be a musician and not be a good dancer, um, uh, kind of almost uniquely Western thing. Anyway, dance and music are inherently connected. I like that they talk about this. God, there's no more love songs in the whole wide world. There seems to be a, a, a fixation on love songs as like the most important type of music in media. I don't know if I entirely agree with it. I think, I think love songs are important, um, but I think there's lots of other emotions that music can express that seem to be like not as important when we're talking about the significance of music in 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 media, uh, like in film and TV shows and things, when like th th there needs to be like we need a love song. Without love songs, the world is. Uh, I mean, what about what about heartbreak? What about loss? I don't know. It seems weird the fixation on love songs. Anyway, it's all yours, honey. I like that the piano is a little bit out of tune in a world where music isn't that important. Like, yeah, why would you uphold the tuning of the piano? It's not as important, right? Uh, especially seeing as they seem to maybe get this off the street or somewhere. I don't know where they got this piano and how they got it on the roof. So it kind of makes sense that it's a little bit dinky and out of tuned. Probably not Millie Gibson's hands. That's how these things tend to go. Maybe, maybe she can play piano. Maybe it's her. This is a nice little sequence. People reacting to music in different ways. Cut so that you don't have to see Millie's hands on the piano. Although, that's, that was... Seems pretty good. Call back to the the toy maker episode. Anyway, I like that the sound of the piano hitting as they land on the ground. Cool. Okay, once again, Sonic Screwdriver doing something that it has never done before, seemingly out of nowhere, but it's a Sonic Screwdriver. Sonic Screwdriver makes sense that it could do something like this, make absolute silence. Like, this is actually one of the more sensical things that the Sonic Screwdriver has done. I think this is really cool to watch the singing and have this complete lack of sound. It's always really, like, disconcerting in media when this happens, but... There's this low, like, drone underneath. Oh, it's so cool, so cool to, to have um, 
no sound or things like seeing the bottle crash. But there's this there's this subtle ambience, and I think this would be far more effective if there was nothing underneath the scene. Like the angle here. Very cool, bringing the sound in like this. I think that could have been more dramatic. I think, and like if you had no sound going to really big sound as the sound comes back, that would have been cooler. I think missed opportunity to do some big, and like to make the sound of the water and the tuning fork, which are normally really quiet sounds, to make them really big and bombastic. A little bit of a missed opportunity in my opinion. Claire de Lune, the most beautiful piece, in my opinion, the most beautiful piece that has ever been written for solo piano. I love that this is Claire de Lune. So beautiful. Which makes what's about to happen even more sad. Piano teleportation, super cool. The way the way they move and the, the like tentacles of music sheet music. Kind of reminds me of Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2. The world did not end in 1963. Right. No, but it didn't. Hey, I'm living proof. I was born in 2004 and all my life I've had Beyonce and some Fender and Strictly and tap dancing and raves and... Oh, my mom sings Danny Boy at Christmas when she's drunk to my gran. Oh, don't you see? All good music. All good music. I'm actually not familiar with Sam Fender, but everything else in there, good music. Come with me. When the Doctor gets stoic like that, it's always really cool. Always really interesting to see what's normally a fun, upbeat character go stoic. June 2024. Uh, it's hard to keep track, but yeah, I think so. June, July. June, July. This came out in May, so... <laughs> what, have we done it? Are we back? 2024. Brought you home. He's scared, he's worried, doesn't know what to do, which is not like him. <laughs> That's that uh, Disney money, putting in the shot of the inside, the CG shot of the inside of the TARDIS door when it's not necessary at all. This is what we're trying to stop. I think without music, the human race goes sour. Without any way of expressing a broken heart, they go to war without even knowing why. Love this. The, uh, like I said earlier on, the Doctor's respect for the value of music, I think, is is really, really cool. I, I love how much reverence he has for music in this episode. Oh, here's Maestro. New outfit. Oh! Love that. Really cool. That transition to the, the black box. Really cool, really cool. I love the making things unreal. I think this is actually really well executed. Very reminiscent of the toy maker earlier in this season, or in the specials that came before. Daddy was so bad to me. Daddy was so mean. Daddy was so tough. Daddy, daddy, me. And that was fine enough. Is that one of the garbage songs from Abbey Road? I think perhaps. Uh, if this creature is music incarnate and loves amazing music so much that the creation of it is... They cannot allow it, then surely they're saving the good music for themselves. Why did they play this? That was not good music, in my opinion. That was not fun to listen to. Daddy daddied me. We can do better. We can do better. If he was a living game, you are the essence of music itself. There you go. Essence of music itself. But what's the point? You've destroyed the world. Music is on. Not gone! <sighs> the sound of a nuclear winter. The purest music of all. Interesting. Interesting. So, this idea that music doesn't have to be notes and that, like, soundscapes can be music, 
the maestro is into some very esoteric 20th century music. I think the maestro would be a big fan of music concrete. <laughs> which would make them <laughs> which would make them a rarity anyway let's keep going i have a feeling that music concrete is not the direction that this is going to go aeolian tones no 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 that's not aeolian tones that is a soundscape aeolian tones would sound like this That's Aeolian tones. It's the sound of the Aeolian scale. This is so dumb. Like I said, this could just have been some random makeshift science sci-fi mumbo jumbo. They do that all the time on this show. Why? Why? Why Aeolian? Not necessary. Anyway. God. Music without the need of people. And every song that goes unsung. Music without the need for people is a really interesting line in what is now the era of generative artificial intelligence music. Music without the need for people. Is it music if it's not made by people? Yes. I think birdsong is music. Very, very simply. Birdsong is music. Ruby said, the wind in the trees. Well, you get music when the wind blows through the trees. Sure, that's music. Is AI music music? Is it art? Perhaps, perhaps not. Perhaps what makes it art, you know, perhaps birdsong isn't art, isn't music, unless it's being perceived by a human, unless we conceive of it as music. This is a very interesting philosophical discussion regarding music and it is not what the show indulges in so let's move on till i can reach out and steal the music of the spheres the music of the spheres so so the music of the spheres music is just frequencies notes are just frequencies events happening in time right if we play an a i don't know if it's this a or if it's one of the other A's, but if we play A, that's 440 hertz, right? The note A is vibrating the air 440 times per second. And as we go higher, the notes are vibrating faster. The frequency is increasing. And as we go slower, or as we go lower rather, the vibrations get slower, right? So this idea between frequency and notes, they're in uh, they are inherently connected. So there was... I can't remember who came up with this idea. Maybe I'll intercut that. But there is this idea that if frequency is events happening in time, then orbits of planets around, for example, our sun are a frequency. The Earth, for example, has a frequency of one rotation every 365 days or once a year and different planets have different frequencies and different relationships between those frequencies. So if the earth is one rotation every year, then Jupiter, for example, orbits the sun every 11.86 years. So the ratio of an earth orbit to a Jupiter orbit is one to 11.8. That is music, because the sound of a chord of multiple notes being played together, we hear that as a chord, but what is actually happening is the interaction between the frequency of one note and the frequency of another note. I'll link some videos in the description that talk a little bit more about this relationship of ratios of frequency, but the basic idea is that if notes and chords are just different frequencies of notes playing against each other, then the spheres, the planets, which orbit our sun at different 
frequencies and then different ratios of frequencies are themselves music. I think it's really cool that the maestro is trying to capture that grander music of the spheres. The universe will stop turning. Yeah. The It'll keen in a minor key. It'll keen in a minor key. I like this dialogue. I think it's, I think it's fun. I don't know if that's what would happen if we stopped the spheres from rotating. I think there's probably a Kurtzgesagt video on what would happen if the planets stopped orbiting the sun, but definitely not a minor chord progression, a minor chord, a minor, minor key. Probably not what happened, but that's not important. It's it's fun dialogue and the you know, keen in a minor key, that physicality, the delivery. I like it. I think it's cool. Aeolian tones across the whole of creation. No, Aeolian. Well, at least they're right that the Aeolian scale is a minor scale. That's correct. So that's something, but. No, no. Anyway. And that lament will be my symphony supreme. Is all of life extinguished? I'm going solo. How did you enter Funny. this world? Oh, a genius. A single silly man who found the lost chord. What? The lost chord? What? See... There's a finite number of chords that we can create in a system of Western tonal harmony. Like there's 88 keys on the piano. There's a limited number of combinations. And I can guarantee you that every single one has been played so many times. You just have to play different combinations. So yes, there's lots of different combinations. I guarantee you that there's no combination of keys that hasn't been played. Although actually, Maybe, maybe not. 88 to however many powers. Maybe, maybe it's possible. But he definitely was playing a melody that's been played before. It's not like he played some weird combination. I, I struggle to believe in this lost chord idea. I would be more inclined to believe it if it involved some kind of microtonality or some kind of tuning system outside of the Western equal tempered system of tuning. Because then we have, then we really do have infinite possibilities for how we can combine different frequencies into chords. But that dude from the intro, I think his name was Timothy Drake, was not playing on such a piano. He was playing on an equally tempered Western piano. So limited possibilities. He wasn't playing anything particularly special. And as this show would have us believe, he was just playing something with a tritone in it, which let's be real is all the time. We are hearing tritones all the time. Incredibly common. So what's going on here? This lost chord, the tritone. I'm not having it. Which means a different combination of notes would banish you. You might be bright. An interesting and premise. Hot and tiny whiny. <laughs> but genius? Oh, honey, I don't think so. We do it. This is really cool. Everything resonates, Doctor dear. Every atom hums. This is absolutely true. Everything has a resonant frequency that it resonates at. And this is why you can have singers who will crack a glass by singing at it because they can tune into the natural resonance of that, the, the material of the glass and make it shatter. This idea of being able to play certain chords to manipulate the world around you is such a, it's such a great sci-fi fantasy bend on the way the world actually works with different objects resonating. The idea of being able to play a certain melody and make the TARDIS uh, uh, materialize itself so cool. I like this. Anything that plays in tune is mine. Strange. Did you 
break it? No. No, 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 that's something else. Hariyama! Right. Interesting that we don't hear the cloister bells, which are the normal sound of the TARDIS um, in distress. Perhaps because the cloister bells themselves are music, and this is something that the maestro controls. So I think it's cool that the sound that the TARDIS makes here is not the traditional sound that we hear. Love the use of angles in this episode. Really love the use of these um, tight angles. Great cinematography. That's not even in tune. I can find the rent. What? He knows he's tuning the guitar. It's not in tune. He knows to tune it. That's at least a nice touch. Wait a minute. No, but just wait. Can you hear that? That music. I love this moment. I thought that was non-diegetic. I love this. Uh, for those that don't know, in media, we have diegetic and non-diegetic sounds uh, and music, right? So diegetic music is music that is happening within the world of the story. So, for example, when we heard the Beatles earlier, or the fake Beatles playing their fake Beatles song. I've got a dog, he's called Fred. That was diegetic. It was happening within the world of Doctor Who. But the soundtrack to Doctor Who... The, the score that Murray Gold has composed is non-diegetic, meaning that it's happening outside of the world of the show. It's something that we, the audience, experience, but the characters in the world of the show do not experience. And I love how this episode has been blending non-diegetic and diegetic music. It's making music that is normally non-diegetic into diegetic music, music that uh, is happening inside the world. Like when the maestro started playing the Doctor Who theme and that transitioned into the actual theme, normally that theme is non-diegetic. It's not part of the world of the show. But in this episode, it was. And this idea of the background music in the scene being uh, seeming like it's non-diegetic soundtrack to the scene, but then actually being diegetic is really cool. Interesting that the Doctor breaks the fourth wall. I don't think the Doctor does this very often, if at all. Like, the idea of there being non-diegetic music, if it were non-diegetic, he shouldn't have been able to hear it. But I think it's funny. Uh, I think it is the audience's reaction as well. Um, I, I like it. I think it's worth bending the rules of the show for moments like this. It was fun. I like it. <laughs> I think it would be really interesting, I'm not going to do it because it would take ages, but to look over the notes that are written on these staves to see how well they match up to the music that's actually being played at any given moment, I think it would be really interesting. My guess is that the animators did not have that level of detail and they probably did not have access to Murray Gold's score when they took the time to animate these. But it would be really cool if they went into that level of detail. No, don't break the windows of Abbey Road Studio, you can't do that! Okay, maybe crazy sci-fi music monster. Maybe that's a worthwhile cause. Another costume, I like this costume. This looks cool, the lips are very unsettling though. Oh, very cool that the, just like how the Doctor could use the Sonic to make everything go silent, the Sonic Screwdriver, a device that is inherently based around sound, can be Destroyed with a with a sung note from the maestro. I like it. Uh, can't trick me twice, honey. These lips are really cool. Like the, the maestro has reached this real anger point, the 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 climax of the story, and their appearance, their visage is starting to disintegrate a little bit. I like it. Maestro, I am asking you, just uh, what? This is a beautiful melody. I don't know who wrote this melody. If Murray Gold, if you wrote this, this is a beautiful melody. And whoever's singing it, beautiful vocal tone. I, I, I don't know if this is Millie Gibson. It sounds like Millie Gibson's voice. So maybe it is Millie Gibson. But, oh, God, it's such a beautiful melody. Let's listen to it again. Maestro. Maestro, I am asking you just... Leap at the start. Oh, such a beautiful melody. There's a 
hidden song deep inside our soul. What is it? The hidden song deep inside our soul. It's Carol of the Bells. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's kind of dumb. I think maybe the maestro is talking about that beautiful melody that we just heard and not Carol of the Bells. I hope, I hope that's what was intended. What is this? Christmas. I love the maestro's tattoo. I think it's really cool. How could a song have so much power? And power okay, so this song is Carol of the Bells. I, look, I've played Carol of the Bells plenty of times at Christmas time and it's fine. It's not even anywhere near the best Christmas song. It does not have magic powers. I think they could have come up with a better song. They could have... Murray Gold, whoever wrote that melody, that was such a beautiful melody, why could that not be the song that has all this magic power? Why Why does it have to be Carol of the Bells? Uh, missed opportunity, again. One of the, I just saw... I just saw... Let's see if I can go back and find it. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so here on the stave... We have a fortissimo marking, a double F. This would never be in the middle of the stave. It would be under the stave. Why is it in the middle? It makes no sense. Let's keep going. Let's let's keep watching. This is the famous Abbey Row piano. They call it the Mrs. M that spun way too fast. That that has got to have the the slickest wheels of any piano I have ever seen. Even even on that like, you know, smooth wooden floor to spin like that. That is special. But this, this is the piano that the Beatles will play on their greatest hits. Penny Lane. <laughs> this is really funny. Uh, the Beatles' greatest hits and the first song the Doctor comes up with is Penny Lane. Penny Lane. What about Obla D Obla Da? What about Here Comes the Sun? What about Blackbird? Uh, uh like Penny Lane? Penny Lane is in my ears and in my eyes. Okay. So I know that this piano is rattling with all the potential to send you back to hell. Oh, sent. Love it when the Doctor sends, he says he's going to send the villains back to hell. Classic callback. Maybe it's maybe it's not a callback, but... Uh, he says this uh, in the finale of Season 2, David Tennant's season. Uh, send the Daleks and the Cybermen back to hell. Very cool. Very cool to hear that again, especially with this pantheon. Are they from hell? Interesting. Scott Joplin, interesting choice for uh, what would be the music to send someone back to hell. I dig it. Maple Leaf Rag. Yeah, fair enough. Cool sound effect, that. Music battle. Oh, this is better be fun. Ah, oh, now playing the violin, this is fun. So the, the violin or the fiddle very commonly an instrument associated with the devil, right? Uh, I think possibly one of the most well-known examples, like the devil went down to Georgia. The devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. Um, the, like the fiddle battle. I like that the maestro goes for the violin. It's kind of very, uh, very fitting for the demonic figure to be playing a fiddle. It definitely plays into the, the canon of musical villainy and musical supernatural villainy throughout history. I like it. Definitely, this is not actually uh, being played, but nice melody. Very cool. This reminds me of the scene from Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, the like symphony battle in that movie. I really liked that. I really enjoyed that. I think it's a it's a really cool concept that I think we should see more in magic and sci-fi and supernatural films. Maybe maybe not too much because it's probably get old very quickly. But I like this like battle of music and the the 
the magical power of music battling off against each other, I think it's really fun. I think it's a really fun way to mix sound and music with what's happening in the story. That is supernaturally fast pizzicato boom ba -dum -ba -bum. That is crazy. You've got to have some like multiple finger plucking technique, I, I would think, to do something like this. Very cool though. Perhaps the kind of thing that a supernatural musical villain could do that a natural human musician could not. Playing b behind the back? I don't know if that makes it cooler, uh, more musical. I think the maestro's melody here is not anywhere near as cool as what they're playing on the piano. Oh! Oh, they won! They broke the maestro's violin! So this is the doctor trying to create a chord to 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 dispel the lost chord to dispel the maestro. Okay, it starts on C. Oh, I would never call myself that maestro, but I have lived and I have loved, and I can only smile like this because I have lost so much. I've experienced everything, oh. every single thing. And if that's where music comes from. I like this. The doctor has musical genius because of his emotional depth. This idea that music comes from uh, a soul that has experienced so much. I like this idea. I think it really makes sense for who the doctor is that he has felt and lived and experienced so much emotion and so many events through his life that he could express that through musical genius I think is fitting E C E C Okay, E C D so we've got a major first three notes of a major tetrachord major scale E again E C D E again interesting I like the music notes appearing up at the top Oh G I like the music notes appearing up the top. I think this is cool, this non diegetic thing. B. Okay, so we've got E, D, E, C, D, E again, G, B. So we've got a major seven, add, add two, add nine. It's a nice chord. Maybe we've got to resolve the major seven up to the root. E flat, the minor third? Um, no. Yeah, it was. So these are the notes that the doctor played, not in order, but going up. C, D, E, G, B. That's nice. Major, seven, add nine. Add two. A little bit tense down here. And then on the top. Yeah, that is a bum note. We could revoice that chord to make it sound a little bit nicer. We could put that D instead of in between the C and the E, we could put it on top and make it a full major nine chord, C major nine. That's quite pretty. If I were going to dispel the devil, I might expand that a little bit further. I might do like a major 13 sharp 11. That's quite pretty. That's what I would play. It might work. Maybe, maybe what the doctor needed to find there was the sharp eleven rather than the, the sharp nine, which is what he played. Anyway, makes sense that he failed. E flat over a C major seven. Sounds pretty cool, but yeah, probably not the note that he was looking for. This is called the music, like, coming out of their mouth. I love their nails. I'm very jealous of their nails. I want those. I like... Okay, so the maestro takes out a bugle, which is kind of like a trumpet, but it doesn't have valves. So it can only play 
the sequence of harmonics. I like that when the maestro picks up the bugle, it is actually a bugle and not like a trumpet playing like a chromatic melody, which we could do on a modern trumpet. Um, I like that this is actually something that a bugle would play. Sorry to keep harping on. <laughs> Funny? Silly pun. I don't think you could play harp very well with those nails. I love the nails. I... Ooh, the notes are still hanging there. That's terrible bass form. That is not at all accurate. This is cool though. The bass opening up, slamming Ruby in there. I think that's cool. Oh, who's... John Lennon! John Lennon is going to be the one to save the day! Timpani? Okay, so unless the maestro is rapidly changing the pedal on the timpani, it shouldn't be able to play two different notes. Right, so a timpani normally plays one note, but as we... Uh, some timpanis will have a pedal that can adjust the pitch of the timpani uh, to uh, go so quickly between the two notes that were being played, it was quite far apart. I think it was a perfect fourth, right? Back and forth between these two notes. Boom, 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 boom. Perfect fourth, back and forth between these two notes. I don't think it would be very easy to quickly tune the skin. And if you did, you would hear the one note ring out and bend up and down between those notes. To have that sound of two different notes, you would need to be hitting two different timpani, two different drums to get that sound. The plural of timpani being timpani. You need to get two different timpani to, to get those two different notes. But anyway, uh, cool to see some love for the timpani. We love our orchestral percussion. Thank you for all that you do, orchestral percussionists. I wish that they had depicted your timpani accurately. But alas, perhaps it's easier to throw the doctor inside of one timpani than it is two. I'm guessing that's why. Very to call. I love the maestro banging the drum like a child would bang on a timpani, or like how the non percussionists would do, where you get to roam around and have muck around in the percussion section, and then the percussionists are so mad because these are their serious instruments and it's it's more than just whacking around on drums. I love how silly the maestro is banging the drum. It's so fun. Ooh, John Lennon's gonna find the secret chord. We need you. What for? I'm no good at any. What is it? What's the secret chord, John? Are you going to figure it out? Is it a major 7 sharp 11? <laughs> very cool POV. Oh, so cool. The eye from behind the inside of the bass. Very cool. I love it. Oh, so cool to see someone inside a timpani. Oh, that is... That is awesome. I don't think a timpani string would stretch that far. And you put them together. Of course, you've got to have John and Paul Lennon McCartney. They have to bring it together. Okay. They just played a major chord. Let's watch, sorry, let's watch that again. I think they just played a major chord. The secret chord that, that dispels the devil is... A major chord. That's it? That's all it took? Was a major chord? That's what I said. See, you can crack a glass with a pitch of your singing. You can do it. Everything resonates. So if you sing at the right pitch, it will crack a glass. I love this. I love this rock and roll soundtrack. This is really cool. And they're back in the piano. John, Paul, you did it. <laughs> the symphony of the urban world. I have to tell you, there is always a twist at the end. Doctor breaking the fourth wall again. Interesting. I like this. I like the the fun dance number at the end of the episode. A little bit of a fourth wall break. A little bit of fun. I like it. But I just wish that the song was better. This kind of just reminds me of the other like garbage songs that we had, like the Beatles song. Great shot of the, the people in the, the studio booth. Classic shot. Reminds me of the music video for Silk Sonic's um... Silk Sonic song. Yeah, this song just doesn't do it for me. I don't know. I Here's the thing. They have all this Disney money, supposedly, and it's a Beatles episode. 
could they not afford to just like play Twist and Shout? Could they not afford the rights to that song? Surely that would have been way more fitting. Especially because that song is from this era of the Beatles, right? It's from their first record. So, surely they should have played that song. It was fun though. It was fun. The song, in my opinion, wasn't that great. It could have been a lot better. That's fun. Grabbing the umbrellas like that. This is fun. Playing some music on the Abbey Road pavement as though it were a piano. More non-diegetic music fun. See, this is cool. I would have just cut to this and not done the, the twist at the end song. Resolve it. Great, thank you. Okay, so there you go. That was The Devil's Chord. That was were my thoughts and reactions and opinions. Overall, a good episode. Much, much better than the one that came before it. A um, uh, great episode. Overall, I like how they are talking about music in this episode. There are lots of things that are really good. The way they talk about music, the way the Doctor feels about music, some of the gags and jokes about music in here are really good. I think the main thing to me is that the, the crux of this episode, this idea of Aeolian tones, this dark music at the end of the world that is going to be bad and bring forth the apocalypse or something is called Aeolian tones. Uh, it, overall, it's a minor thing. I hate funny. It's a minor thing. Um, it's, it's a small thing, but I, it would be so easy to fix this. And the fact that it made it all the way through the writing process and no one ever said, hey, could we just make up some random word? I feel like that could have been fixed. But outside of that, basically everything in here is really, really good. Lots of fun moments. Uh, a few missed opportunities. But overall, really, really strong. I think one of the biggest missed opportunities is that the Beatles aren't really in this episode. Like, they have that conversation at the start, and then at the end, John and Paul inexplicably save the day by playing a C major chord. Which is so dumb. But other than that, the Beatles aren't really in this episode. I think there's still an opportunity, and I hope that they don't think, because they've done this, that they can't do it later. I think there is an opportunity to have a real, actual, deep character moment with the Doctor and the Beatles. And George and Ringo, where's the love for George and Ringo? I think that's the main missed opportunity. The main missed opportunity, there could have been so much more with the Beatles in this episode. I think they could have been more involved in solving the the problem of the maestro in the end they're the ones who do it but there's no build up into that they just appear and play a chord on the piano i think it would have been really cool to have them involved and kind of travel a little bit with ruby and the doctor through this episode but it's fine uh hopefully we'll get another episode with more of the actual beatles in future that's my hope uh but anyway i think those are my thoughts on this episode i hope you enjoyed this video, I hope you enjoyed hearing some of my reactions and thoughts. If you have any questions about the music that showed up in this episode of Doctor Who, leave them down in the comments and I'll see if I can maybe do some research or if I can answer them. Um, I love talking about music and I love talking about Doctor Who, so leave them down below. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're interested in this kind of stuff and you want to hear me talk about more musical things. If you want me to react to some more music and media, leave a comment down below of what you want me to react to. I'd love to do this kind of video again in future. And if you're interested in some more Doctor Who kind of content, then a few years back I actually wrote the theme for a Doctor Who podcast called The Nymon Be Praised, and I was actually on an episode of the show talking about one of my favourite Doctor Who serials, The Greatest Show in the Galaxy. That's linked down in the description below. You can hear the music I wrote for that show and hear me talk a little bit more about Doctor Who. If you're interested in some of the music that I have made, uh, you're in luck. There's some uh, videos up here on the screen. You can go take a listen, and there's links in the description to my music as well. I think that's all for now. Like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.